Good morning, everyone online. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we will be beginning the breakfast briefing in a couple of minutes time. Thank you for bearing with us. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this month's market briefing. Um, do appreciate those that are here live. We could actually do it this time as there's no train strikes. And fortunately, the weather's calmed down as well. So we could all make it into the city. Um, this month's market briefing is on autonomous vessels, the theory and the progress in the future. Um, oops, sorry. So um, we, this is an accreditation with the uh, Chartered Insurance Institute. Um, Delicates participant accredited one hour CPD point. Um, so we um, do appreciate um, you taking part in this. Our main presenter today is Chris Cox, who's, um, who is our maritime electronic data analyst based with us here in London. Um, but he previously worked with ABL in our Singapore operations. Chris is involved in a number of projects related to digital software design, use of electronic data in the marine casualty analysis and well supporting in our clean shipping and maritime decarbonisation team. He is a specialist in MADAS, the marine accident data analysis suite, as well as in the use of various other tools and analysis of AIS data to determine the causation of a casualty. We're delighted he's sharing his digital ex expertise today to talk on the subject of autonomous ships and where the market is currently at with progress in this technology. Uh, he will be taking questions at the end of his talk, by the way, so please hold any of those for just as he finishes before the market case reports. The information contained um, in these presentations and opinions expressed to those of the presenters and not necessarily those of the ABL group. Use your caveat supply, Chatham House rules, and the information contained in these presentations and any opinions, as I said, are those are not necessarily those of ABL. So we want your feedback. Um, that's very important. Number one, it, um, it could, maintains that CPT accreditation. Um, so at the end of today's briefing, we can please everyone take three minutes out of their time to complete the online survey. Um, as I say, it keeps our, our accreditation. It also means we can act, actively look back on how to improve these briefings to match your requirements and needs. As an example, we always ask for subjects that we can talk about these briefings and today's one is one that comes up often in those feedback forms, so it shows that we do listen to you. So if there are, are any subjects, please put them on there. Uh, it would be great. We also send questions out at the end of this for win a bottle of champagne. And as you can see by the lack of bottle of champagne, nobody answered the questions last month. So if you can do that, you never know, you might become famous like Tony Walker. OK, so today's learning objectives. Um, so we have to put these for our accreditation. And so we have four of those today. You'll be able to define what, auto what are autonomous vessels. You'll be able to list the benefits of using autonomous vessels and the challenges the sector faces. You'll be able to cite real world examples of the progress being made with autonomous vessels. And you will understand what lies ahead in the future of autonomous shipping. We'll go over these again at the end of the presentation to just confirm that we've hopefully reached these objectives. And before, and finally, before I hand over to Chris, we'd like to uh, ask you for a few moments for to seafaring men and women at sea today. 
even though we're talking about autonomous shipping, shipping seems quite strange. Um, even though we dare to whisper that COVID-19 does seem to be increasingly in the rearview mirror, we know that seafarers are still working often longer than they are meant to do due to crew change issues. And irrespective of COVID-19, there are, of course, a multitude of other factors going on in the world which impact adversely on the lives and conditions of seafarers. Many of our own colleagues come from the seafaring background, so crew welfare is a cause that is close to our hearts. As such, we are signatory to the Neptune Declaration, which has undoubtedly played some part in getting seafarers vaccinated against the virus. Do look into this and consider perhaps your own company to become a signatory. Now, Chris, it's all yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along. It's nice to see um, quite a quite a number here. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone tuning in online. So what are we going to cover in this? Well, after a quick introduction, just uh, go through the, the theory of what autonomous vessels are, what autonomy is, and some of the technical terms associated with it. And then we'll go through some of the uh, benefits and why autonomous vessels are a thing and then the challenges that the sector faces. And then we'll look through some real world examples to show the progress that's been taken in the autonomous shipping world. And then finally, what the, the future steps are for the industry. So before we begin, just a quick background on myself. Um, Steve said some of it, but essentially my role at ABL Group is a maritime electronic data analyst. I have over 13 years of experience analyzing mar maritime data and writing software to process maritime data, both for routine and incident investigation purposes. I joined ABL Group in December 2019 over in the Singapore office, and then I transferred to the London office in January of this year. Um, I was partly hoping to come back to the cooler climate, but given this week, I'm not sure it's worked out as expected. Um, I have a degree in software engineering from the University of Southampton, and I previously worked as a software engineer at Avenca Limited, who are the developers of MADAS, the Marine Accident Data Analysis Suite. So let's uh, start and go into some of the, the theory. And the first thing I wanted to do really was to break down some of the, the technical terms and kind of put them into plain language for you, because uh, some of these terms you, you might have heard and don't really have a, a full grasp of what they mean. So what is autonomy? Autonomy is the, the process of automating previously human driven tasks. Um, and this replies, re relies on the ability for intelligent decision making based on certain inputs. So if you take a very simple example, like uh, a light, which is triggered by a motion sensor, that's a very basic input. The motion sensor detects motion, the light comes on. It's very simple, and that's a, a, a one input causing an action. But as the complexity of tasks for to be automated increases, then so does the number of factors involved in making these decisions. And this is where we need artificial intelligence or AI. And what is AI? It's very easy to think of, um, you know, the, the robots you see in films that look like humans, talk like humans as being AI. But all AI is at its essence is a computer system which takes inputs and certain rules and then makes decisions or takes actions based on those. Um, so they do that using a decision model, like a decision tree and then they're able to make the decisions um, in similar complexity to those that a human can. And then machine learning is kind of the next step of AI, which is where an AI system has the ability to learn from previously um, inputted data in order to make new decisions or estimations in the future. So that's a bit of background about autonomy. So what are autonomous vessels? So the official term by the IMO are Maritime Autonomous Surface Ships, or MASS. 
And there are different levels of autonomy available. And these vary from a range of minor automatic processes on board the ship and decision-making support to full-blown autonomous vessels sailing by themselves. They, the IMO recognize four degrees of autonomy, which I've listed there, but I'll read out the, uh, the full descriptions here. So degree one, a ship with automated processes and decision support. Seafarers are on board to operate and control shipboard systems and functions. Some operations may be automated and at times be unsupervised, but with seafarers on board ready to take control. And then degree two, remotely controlled ships with seafarers on board. The ship is controlled and operated from another location. Seafarers are available on board to take control and to operate the shipboard systems and functions. And then degree three is a remotely controlled ship without the seafarers on board. So the ship is controlled and operated completely from another location. And then finally, degree four, which is the fully autonomous ship, where the operating system of the ship is able to make decisions and determine actions by itself. And it's important to note that a mass vessel may switch between these degrees during a single voyage, for example. So you could have a case where an autonomous vessel, it runs autonomously while it's at sea. And then when it comes into a harbor, perhaps it gets taken over and uh, remote controlled in the berthing maneuver. So, so a vessel isn't particularly fixed in one of these degrees. So that's what they are. But what technology do we require, require to run them? Well, much of the additional technology required can al already be found in similar products. So obviously, autonomous cars is the, the prime example. You know, they have self-navigating cars now that's still being trialed, uh, but all that those algorithms already exist. And also many of the, the sensors which we require. So we already have um, some sensors on ships which can be used in the process of making them autonomous. So we have things like AIS, radar and GPS for tracking other vessels, tracking your own position. Uh, but then we also have sonar for depth sounders and LIDAR, which is uh, a laser system uh, being used to measure distances based on uh, the time it takes for a laser to be returned to the source. And then if we can combine these with existing technology like infrared cameras, motion sensors, and, and others, then we have all the, the technology we need already. Um, we also require decision-making algorithms. So as I said before, this is kind of the heart of AI. And these, these algorithms already exist in other systems like autonomous cars. And then vessels in degrees two or three will require technology to remotely operate them. And then involved in that could be augmented reality, AR, which is slightly different from virtual reality. What AR is, is when you enhance real world images like a, a camera feed, with computer generated information to give the operator more information than just the, the pure camera feed. So that very quickly was just some of the theory behind autonomous vessels. So let's move on to why we're actually doing this and the benefits of them. So safety is a major one. So unsurprisingly, majority of accidents in the shipping world are caused at least in part by human error. Uh, different studies estimate anywhere between 60 and 95 percent of marine incidents are caused in part by human error. Um, it depends on which studies you look at. The, the numbers can vary significantly. And this can be due to a number of reasons, including fatigue, insufficient training, uh, plain old incompetence. And this, this can be exacerbated by increased workloads and pressure of competition. An AGCS study of almost 15,000 marine liability insurance claims between 2011 and 2016 showed that human error led to over $1.6 billion of losses. And so if we can reduce the number of seafarers controlling ships, then obviously the hope will be that we can reduce the number of marine incidents. And a reduction in marine incidents will protect seafarers' lives and the environment. And obviously because autonomous vessels will need less or no crew if there are incidents occurring then there is even more less risk of um, human casualties so another benefit are the the long-term cost savings 
so uh, some estimates suggest that the, the crew costs can range anywhere between 20 to 30% of the operating costs of a cargo ship, and then going up to 50 to 65% of those of a ferry. Uh, reducing the number of crew required on board should therefore, in long term, be cost effective. And additionally to this, autonomous ships can be designed to be uh, lighter and more fuel efficient, because if there's no crew or less crew on board, then less space needs to be taken up for things like crew quarters, um, equipment for the crew, and you know all their luxuries like swimming pools maybe um, can can be taken out to to make the vessel lighter and more fuel efficient. And this will obviously have uh, a follow-on impact on the um, environment because more for fuel efficient means less emissions. Um, but these cost savings are somewhat balanced out by the need for the extra investment up front. Uh, so you, you, if you have a remote control vessel, you will need a remote control center built for that, monitoring centers, uh, and the, the actual technology at the moment will make autonomous vessels more expensive to build than a traditional vessel. But over time, that technology will get cheaper. And then the final benefit is the reduced threat of piracy. So if you have a vessel with no crew on it, that's of less interest to pirates because if there's no crew, there's no one to hold hostage and to demand ransom for. Additionally, uh, ships can be designed in a way that makes it harder to actually get aboard them. So if you have an autonomous ship that doesn't require a pilot to board by the sea, for example, then you can make it much more difficult to board the vessel by sea which can reduce the, the threat of piracy. You can then restrict access to the manual controls and the cargo if there's less need for them to be accessed daily. And you can have protocols in place so that if a vessel is pirated, then it can either be shut down remotely so that it can't sail, or it can be remotely forced to navigate to a particular location for the authorities. So those are the benefits, but, um, and excuse the pun, it's not going to be plain sailing to bring in autonomous vessels. Um, so now we'll go through some of the challenges that the industry faces. So reliability is a big one. So a traditional vessel with a full crew will be able to undergo maintenance and repairs while it's at sea. Ships are made up of a complex system of propulsion machinery, generators, pumps, cooling systems, and all of these can be prone to fault. And so obviously an autonomous vessel with no crew aboard could easily end up stranded at sea. So what can we do to overcome this? Well, there's a few ideas floating. So engineers could continue to go out at sea with the autonomous vessel, kind of defeats the whole purpose of autonomous shipping. So maybe not the ideal solution. We could increase redundancy in equipment on the vessels. So for example, a two, a two engine system on a vessel, so that if one of them fails, the vessel can still continue and get to its location for full repairs. Uh, my colleague uh, Sen did a presentation on autonomous vessels and he went into some detail on those kind of systems. So if you're interested in that, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it's quite interesting, but it goes into much more technical detail on those kind of systems. And then finally, we can replace some of the existing technology with new ones. So for example, a traditional um, fuel-based engine could be replaced with an electric motor, which is less prone for fault. Okay, and moving on, more challenges. So the data connections. So when vessels are relying on VSAT for communications, it can be very, very slow and very expensive. And this will obviously cause issues for autonomous vessels, especially for those uh, with remote control. Because for remote control, you need video feeds and live data feeds, and these require high bandwidth. So this is a challenge that will need to be overcome in the long term. And then cybersecurity, we hear about every day, you know, an ever-growing issue in every aspect of our lives. So as the number of digital systems we use increases, so does the number of, of opportunities for hackers. We've already seen this in the, the maritime industry. 
We've seen AIS manipulation and spoofing, as well as incidents involving the hacking of ECDIS systems. So clearly autonomous vessels will need to be very resilient from outside attacks. But not only that, it's very important that they're able to detect malicious activity coming from the outside. So for example, if you have a case where there is some AIS spoofing going on and some fake vessels popping up, we need our autonomous vessel to be able to automatically detect that so that it, the self-navigation systems are not fooled by it, because otherwise that could lead to incidents. Right, one of the more complex issues, regulations. So all vessels must adhere to the regulations such as SOLAS and Colrex, uh, but these regulations do not currently account for autonomous vessels. The IMO have released an interim set of guidelines for mass trials, but these are very basic and somewhat vague. Uh, as an example, they have a section on cyber risk management, and this simply states, appropriate steps should be taken to ensure sufficient cyber risk management of the systems and infrastructure used when conducting mass trials. So what does that mean? That's It's very vague. It doesn't give, um, there's no certification that the equipment needs on board to prove that it reaches that standard. So obviously these will be more fully developed, but at the moment they don't exist. Uh, the outcomes of a regulatory scoping exercise performed by the IMO were released in June last year, 2021. And this identifies some high priority issues that will need to be overcome. So I've listed them there. So the meanings of the term master, crew, or responsible person, because obviously with an autonomous vessel, these change. The functional and operational requirements for a remote control station or center. The issues with designating a remote operator as, as a seafarer. So will the remote operator need to be a seafarer? Will it just be a, a program? It could be anything. And then a glossary of new terminology will also be required. Moving on, another complicated issue are those matters of insurance and litigation. So clearly, insurers will need to develop new policies designed for mass vessels. Much of the, the English law on marine insurance is, including the Marine Insurance Act of 1906, is based on case law. And clearly, the kind of problems and incidents that we're going to come across with autonomous vessels will not be covered by these previous cases. So it will be a lengthy and complicated process to adjust these laws. Questions will need to be asked about whether, a, for example, a ship owner's vicarious liability will extend to remote ship operators, or whether these remote operators, if not, will be entitled to limit their liability. The areas where ship owners can be found liable will need to be clearly defined. For example, obviously poor maintenance on an autonomous vessel on not keeping the software update, those could be examples of where the ship owners can be found liable. But where do we draw the line? And then if blame is shifted away from seafarers and instead to, let's say, the software programmers of the navigation systems, will software developers be able to limit their liability? Possibly unlikely. And if there is a share of blame between remote operators and the software, would the ship owners be held entirely liable under a no-fault based liability? And then moving on, the, the seaworthiness of vessels also becomes more complicated when we have autonomy to consider. So for example, the Hague-Visby rules state that a vessel can only be deemed seaworthy if it's properly manned with a master and crew. So will the remote operators of an autonomous vessel be classed as a master and crew in this instance? And will the cameras on the vessel fulfill the requirement of having a proper lookout? p &I clubs often use independent experts to assist with determining the cause of an incident and where the liability lays. And traditionally, these experts will, be, will have experience at sea as mariners. So as incidents with autonomous vessels begin to occur, where would the appropriate experts come from? 
Will it be the likes of software engineers who will be required for this role? And will insurers, accident investigators, and third-party experts be able to gather enough information from the software system on board an autonomous ship in order to conduct a full investigation as to whether the software led to the incident? It can be very difficult to get out enough information to do that. So that's all the theory. So let's move on and have a look at the progress being made in the autonomous shipping world today. So degree one, and I'll remind you, were ships with auto automated processes and decision support with seafarers still on board. Now this is actually quite widespread in the industry already. So an example here is voyage planning software. So these take a number of inputs, including the electronic charts, departure and arrival top ports, uh, ship details like draft limits, and can take in weather data. And then they can automatically optimize a passage plan for a voyage. This is AI decision making in action. Another example, automated mooring. So the mooring process is one of the most dangerous operations. And we already have some specialist equipment on the market which can uh, remove these safety issues. So there you can see two examples from Trelleborg and Cavatech, which both use vacuum technology in order to moor a vessel at a port. And all this can be controlled remotely. And these, these actually give other benefits such as reducing the, um, the damp, they actually dampen the, the vessel motion so that the vessel is less impacted by wash from other vessels or rough weather. So moving on to degree two, which are remotely controlled ships with seafarers on board. So the Switzer Hermann was the world's first, first remotely operated commercial vessel. And this was a remotely operated tug operated from Copenhagen using technology developed by Rolls-Royce Marine back in 2017. The tug was fully operated remotely by the captain and it underwent some berthing and maneuvering exercises. A crew did remain on board during these operations, which is why it's still classed as degree two in this case. And then after Kongsberg's acquisition of Rolls-Royce Marine, a new project named Rico Tug was announced between them and Switzer. And the aim of this Rico Tug project will be to develop a remotely operated tug, which is capable of a full towage operation. And then degree three, so remotely controlled ship without seafarers on board. And I've got a little video here. Just play that. If it will play. There we go. Um, I took this from the Samsung Korean YouTube channel, so excuse some of the Korean subtitles. Uh, but this is the Samsung T8 Tug, which in 2020, Samsung completed a test of remotely controlling with no crew on board, as you can see. And this trial combined technologies of collision avoidance, autopilot, and remote control. So the tug was operated from more than 150 miles away with augmented reality technology, the AR that I was speaking about earlier. And here you can see it being operated and he has the, the full camera view from the vessel. And then you can also see the AR. So the extra information like the other ship's names being put on that display. And automated collision avoidance technology was also demonstrated which is obviously a critical element for degree four autonomy. So here you can see another tug coming across its path and then the collision avoidance technology automatically avoids it. So another degree three example and a very different use case is the Maritime Mine Countermeasures MMCM Future Mine Warfare System. So this is a joint program between the UK and France. The first prototypes of unmanned surface and underwater vessels, which allow sailors to perform mine hunting operations from outside of the minefield, 
have now been delivered to both countries. This is a joint project involving work and technology from a whole group of companies. I've listed some of them there. And it consists of an unmanned surface vessel, a towed sonar device and portable operations center. And this will allow navies to safely detect and clear mines without entering the minefield and putting themselves at risk. And then finally, degree four, fully autonomous vessels. So the Mayflower 400, this is a solar powered, fully autonomous 15 meter long boat developed by IBM and Promer. The aim was to retrace the 1620 voyage of the Mayflower across the Atlantic Ocean from Plymouth in the UK to Plymouth in Massachusetts. After a failed attempt in 2021 due to technical issues, the voyage was successfully completed on 30th of June this year after five weeks at sea, with only mechanical failures leading to unplanned stops in Portugal and Canada. But the automated navigation systems, they all worked fine for the whole voyage. And video feeds from the vessels could be viewed either live or subsequently downloaded to monitor the vessel's activities. And then a very famous example of a, a degree four fully auto autom autonomous vessel is the Yara Birkeland. So this was built as the world's first electronic, electric and autonomous container vessel developed by Masterly, which is a joint venture between Kongsberg and Wilhelmsen. So it began a two year trial period this year in Norwegian waters in April, and it will operate with a full crew for the first year before gradually transitioning to running fully autonomously by the end of the trial. The vessel will replace over 40,000 diesel lorry trips per year as it transports fertilizer seven nautical miles from the Yara factory to the port of Brevik. And electricity is provided by hydroelectric sources, meaning that the vessel has zero emissions. So that's the progress. So where do we go from here? What are the next steps? So as we've just seen, there are many examples of research projects and autonomous vessels already out there used for a variety of tasks and different use cases. And so this shows that the technology is pretty much already there and already available. The mandatory mass code developed by the IMO is estimated to enter force in January 2028. And whether existing regulations will be updated to capture autonomous vessels is undecided. Modifying the existing regulations could lead to inconsistencies or confusion and could bring up potential barriers for existing traditional vessels. So more likely, a new set of independent mass regulations will be put into force and the existing regulations will only be changed where strictly necessary. Existing case law we need to be adjusted to satisfy the new challenges faced with the introduction of autonomous vessels. And this will be a long and complex task. Insurers will need to develop policies designed for autonomous vessels, and this is already underway. Some insurers do have uh, policies already available. And then we still have many questions that need answering. So how do you determine the liability in an incident where human error cannot be found? What extent will the makers of software and technology be held liable in these cases? And then finally, I've just got a quote here from Hakan Magnus, the Crown Prince of Norway. He said this um, at the christening ceremony of the Yara Birkeland this year, that it takes courage to create something new. It requires investment, patience, and the ability to not give up after the first try. Innovation requires trial and error, and trial and error again until you succeed. And this is reflective, not just of individual trials, but the whole industry, because it will not be a straightforward to, to integrate, not be a straightforward task to integrate autonomous vessels into the world of shipping. There's likely to be some resistance on the way. There's going to be job losses to seafarers, for example. And if there are high profile incidents involving autonomous vessels, that could hold back the industry too. However, the, the long-term cost, safety, and environmental benefits uh, produced by autonomous vessels should make them widely accepted in the industry. 
So that's it. And now we are open for questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we do have some questions online. The first one, how much system redundancy percentage can we expect? System redundancy percentage. Um, that's hard to say. You'll probably be looking at at least 100%. Um, I would say it, it depends on the system and the, the reliability of those systems. <clears throat> So it, it kind of it depends on the the particular system that you're talking about. Perhaps if the person that asked the question would like to follow up to, yeah. Yeah, to no be problem. more specific, please do. Um, are there any expectations for autonomous vessels to respond to non-autonomous vessels in distress? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, how much? assistance an autonomous vessel can help uh, a vessel in distress that would require more technology which i haven't actually spoken about today so that's a very interesting one um and that could be areas that well they will need to be researched in order to answer that question but yeah very interesting and uh i can imagine autonomous uh recovery vessels perhaps in the future, designated just for that purpose. Whether that technology gets put onto um, other autonomous vessels, we will see. And a follow up to that question, I'm not sure perhaps mm -hmm. this can't be answered. If so, do autonomous vessels have any built in areas for seabearer safety? Um, at the moment, I I'm not sure uh, the research is that far. As we're just in trial trials at the moment, I think as autonomous vessels get come onto the market in the mainstream, that's when um, the, the areas of safety will be looked at in more detail. Um, next question: Collision avoid technology is being used that should be based on Colreg. In your presentation, slide 20, you said coal, reg, and solace are not accountable. How is this tech being developed? So what, what I meant by um, the, the coal regs not accounting for autonomous vessels is that some of the terminology in them um, cannot be applied to autonomous vessels. So the, the rules of the, the sea will need to be followed by the um, automatic navigation systems and that is where those systems will that's what they will be built on so so my comment on the the coal regs and the and that was was only strictly on a kind of terminology basis no more questions online at the moment perhaps in the room okay any questions in the room Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I think there does need to be agreements and certification on the the algorithms that are used, either standardized algorithms or um, the, the software is tested and certified by a third party to check that it reaches the um, kind of uh, agreements that will need to be decided in advance of that. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, 
I will pass you over to the very capable hands of Paul. Thank you, Chris. That was uh, very interesting. Um, one of uh, your, your comments um, on your slides there involving um, you know, deep sea shipping and um, diesel engines. I think we're a long way off from having uh, to seeing uh, autonomous ships um, operating with um, big diesel engines. So there's something uh, I was talking about yesterday, alternative fuels. As, um, as the IMO uh, regulations for zero carbon um, kick in and the uh, 2050 target for um, zero uh, emissions from shipping or 50% reduction in greenhouse gases, this will run in parallel with um, autonomous shipping, I believe. And uh, the new engines, particularly in the short sea trade, ferries and uh, coasters, um, that can adapt to electric uh, propulsion um, and um, hydrogen fuel cells, I think um, they are the ones that are going to become autonomous, uh, first of all, as we've seen with the, uh, the, the Yara Birkeland. So I think we're a lot further away from deep sea, although, the deep sea voyages are, are, are less risky, of course, because there's less traffic. So, you know, but again, you've uh, you've got to deal with the propulsion, uh, and uh, we're we're nowhere near having a reliable diesel engine um, without any uh, engineers on board at the at the moment. Those are my comments on that. So, without that, I'm going to talk about the uh, case reports this uh, this month, um, and I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to be a bit uh, snappy with it. But I've got. Uh, just to read this, case reports, what are they? Uh, these feature largely, but not exclusively, hull and machinery casualties with estimated cost of repair in excess of uh, 250,000 US dollars, uh, excluding salvage costs usually. They cover only a subset of the total uh, ABL caseload, um, typically about 10%. Estimated costs are often preliminary and subject to further inspections, investigations, etc. And a copy of this presentation or previous ones is available on request. So looking at the case reports uh, in June 2022 by number, no surprise, we see the usual 40% uh, uh, engine room machinery um, cases, um, followed by collisions and lesions, uh, groundings, explosions, and uh, heavy weather, um, much the same as, uh, as, as usual. But here we see, um, in terms of uh, by number and cost um, comparison, you can see that in June there, there's a bit of a spike there, flooding and listing. Um, that always uh, that just takes one vessel to to spike that one up there. When you've got an engine room flooding, um, you've got uh, huge damage and um, and huge costs um, if it is to be repaired and it's not a CTL. So that's uh, that's what we've seen in the last month. And um, year to date, um, the pattern still uh, develops as it usually does. Um, one day I'm going to be surprised and find out something different in this uh, in this pattern, but uh, it's uh, generally the same. We're still seeing the most uh, uh, claims that we're dealing with are engine room machinery by far, and the other ones uh, also follow in line. So going on to the casualties this month that I'm going to talk about. This is, um, first up is a bulk carrier, uh, carrying sugar, that was uh, reported to have pitched into a pier, causing damage to the vessel. Um, this is a bit unusual because the, the vessel was alongside and tied up. Um, it was reported that after mooring alongside a pier, uh, the vessel experienced a swell um, that uh, was considered unsafe by the master. Uh, so this is a you know a, a, a basically an unsafe uh, berth uh, situation. Due to these high swells, the vessel began rolling, um, and it was very difficult to maintain um, the stability of the vessel. So as well as rolling, it began pitching and um, and rolling as well. So this affected the mooring uh, ropes, and after a headline reportedly snapped, the master contacted the pilot and, and the agent with intentions to, to get off the berth and uh, go to sea, the safest place. Um, although the pilot uh, came on board, no tugs responded to, um, to, to this uh, request um, or the pilot's call. So uh, the vessel had to uh, sort of contact them locally and um, obviously there were delays in this. Uh, so so the, 
vessel continued to roll against the pier and uh, caused damage to the hull, uh, estimated to be in the region of 800,000. Uh, and this is, um, you know, this is not just one um, contact, but several. So uh, this is why the uh, the estimate of steel news is so high. But eventually, the, the, the pilot um, did turn up. Oh, the pilot was on board, and the tugs turned up. Um, the tugs weren't powerful enough to get the vessel off the berth, and um, he made contact with the pier again. So it was a continual um, uh, affair of, uh, of damage. Just, it's just showing you the internal damage there. And obviously there's gonna be quite a few um, uh, days worth of uh, repairs to, uh, to, to deal with the, uh, the hull renewals. But next one, uh, we've got sank capsize, and this is a tender to a super yacht. I was just talking to uh, one of our yacht surveyors, uh, um, Paul Saunders a bit earlier about this one, because he was dealing with this case uh, remotely. Um, uh, the question is why, why, uh, my question is why are tenders being towed by super yachts? And, and the answer to that is because they are quite large vessels and uh, they're not designed to actually go on board like a lifeboat is on a uh, conventional ship. Uh, so they're, they're being towed around. And there have been a lot of claims associated with tenders uh, to super yachts over the years. Um, and we've been involved in the last couple of years with, um, with assisting and writing um, uh, wordings for, for clauses, the tender clause, for example, um, requiring the, uh, the super yacht owner to, um, to perform some certain tasks uh, when towing a tender, um, as one would expect in a, in a commercial tow. You know, you, you've got to have some indication on board the tender um, that it's taken on water. Um, it's got to have navigation lights. You should have an, a bilge pump, an automatic bilge pump to pump water out. Uh, and it did an AIS. So if it does go adrift, um, you lose the tow, you, you can go back and find it again. So so all these things have actually, um, with the inclusion of this tender clause in, uh, in the policies, has actually reduced the number of uh, tender claims we've seen. But already this year, we've had, uh, we've had three come across our, our desk. So they're, they're still happening. At this particular case, is uh is quite unusual because the um I'll, I'll read out the text here the chief engineer woke uh, uh the master of the super yacht to inform him that the tender was low in the water on inspection it was noted that this water was over the deck and uh wind chop was splashing into the boat uh the chief officer and the second engineer this is whilst anchor by the way so not underway um and the second engineer donned life jackets wetsuits and paddled a kayak out to the tender the second engineer reported that the emergency fire pump had seized. Now, this was placed on board to um, to pump out water if necessary. It was the emergency fire pump um, because the actual onboard bilge pump wasn't working. So it was a catalogue of uh, disasters. Uh, so they attempted to bail out the water um, with buckets, but uh, couldn't keep out with the water ingress. And uh, the master told them to abandon uh, attempts and come back to the uh, to the mother yacht. Uh, they arrived back uh, safely, and shortly afterwards, the uh, the tender capsized. And as you can see from this picture, this is a substantial um, boat. Uh, as you can see by the claim, you know it's uh, it's it's going to cost a fair bit there. And you can see with the tow line still attached, you can see it's been uh, hoisted out the water now, um, whilst that uh, being towed alongside. And um, it, it's. Yeah, it, there's got to be a lot of work to, in assessing uh, the damage to it. But as well as the, the the obvious damage to the electronics, the control systems, you know, we, we've got the engine which has been uh, saturated in water, um, and potentially we've got the um, the, the hull structure uh, being carbon fiber or fiberglass that could be delaminated and could have uh, seawater uh, problems there. So there's a lot of things to identify in this uh, particular claim. So repairs can be um, complete fairly quickly on a small vessel like this, but um, we've informed that the uh, the outboard motors, the three outboard motors on the back there, um, aren't available for 12 months. Which is astonishing, but uh, this is the nature of, uh, of world trade at the moment. Um, things aren't off on the shelf and uh, aren't as available as uh, as they could be. There will be a solution to this. Though. Uh, there'll be um, parts that can be available and in this case you can buy the engine block 
uh, and change uh, change the parts for the uh, for the outboard so that you can get this uh, tender uh, back in the water and servicing the uh, mother yacht straight away. Looking at this uh, passenger vessel, uh, this is a, a paint failure, and this is an interesting one. Um, here we've got a, a dry dock passenger vessel that suffered from paint failure. The, the owners were advised that the recently applied hull um, paint coating had started lifting away from the bulbous bow and could be seen around the water. It was further advised that the full extent of the failure of the coating was still yet to be ascertained. But uh, prior to the paint failure, it was remarked the vessel being prepared in, in a dry dock by uh, UHP, ultra high water pressure washing. Um, and th this is a standard uh, preparation. Uh, it's not as good as grip blasting back to, to, to metal, but it's a standard um, preparation for, for another coat. Uh, the vessel was finished, this is the, the key part, was finished with a silicon based self polishing um, underwater system. So this is an alternative to uh, your usual anti-fouling systems. It sheds uh, it sheds microns of um, of material as as you go along, and it's where this um, silicon-based uh, uh, paint actually met the conventional paint at the uh, waterline is where um, the problems occurred. So something wasn't right. The manufacturers of the paint didn't talk to the manufacturers of the other paint, or somebody um, somebody got it wrong there, and that's resulted in uh, in, in in quite a hefty uh, uh, repaint and uh, you know resurface uh, job, estimated in that around about uh, half a million um, pounds at the moment. And here you can see, not uh, that clear in the picture, but. Uh, Evident there, and and lastly, um, propeller damage. Uh, uh, nice standard uh, um, propeller damage here. It was reported by the vessel's master that the vessel was uh, in ballast condition, um, and a high level alarm in the stern tube gravity oil tank was triggered. Uh, the master decided to proceed to an inner anchorage for inspection and propeller assessment, which is um, which is a good move because that doesn't always happen. But um, a wise decision. So, so while at anchor, the uh, rescue boat was uh, lowered and the propeller inspected, finding that the propeller blade, obviously they'd ballasted the vessel to get the uh, prop out of the water here. Uh, the propeller blade on a CPP prop um, was cracked and some cables, um, uh, rubbing marks were found around um, blade number two and four. So with the assistance of harbor tugs, the vessel was moved to the lay-by berth um, where the, the vessel was trimmed. Yeah, it was possible to uh, confirm that some of the ropes, or well, some ropes, were found entangled between the propeller shaft in way of the uh, simplex seals. So a standard uh, uh, propeller damage and stern tube damage that we see quite frequently, um, and, uh, and a cost of 250 uh, US dollars. Here we go. And and to be honest with you, that's nothing more to say to that one, um, apart from the fact that um, for repairs, dry docking will be uh, required. Uh, sometimes this uh, this sort of repair can be done in the water, um, but it depends on the uh, on the ship and uh, the structure of the ship and uh, and basically where you are in the world. Uh, we, we reckon this is a, um, a dry docking job because there will be some repairs to the actual stern tube itself uh, that will be required. And with that, um, I'm just going to conclude with the learning objectives. But I hope you've uh, hope you've learned today. You'll be able to define what autonomous vessels are. Hope you, hopefully you should be able to. Um, you'll be able to list the benefits of using autonomous vessels and the challenges the sector faces. You'll be able to cite real-world examples of the progress being made with autonomous vessels. And uh, you will understand what lies ahead in the future of autonomous shipping. Well, hopefully you will do anyway so with that uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention thanks for um uh, turning up today next market briefing will be on the 11th of august um if uh, if you're in please uh, join us again soon oh and another slide an extra one here look after the uh, following slide um ais quick view service um because you must have uh, put this one in uh, this is a new service we've uh, we've developed um, from Chris, who will um, basically give you a snapshot of an incident um, without the 
huge cost of a full investigation. Um, something that um, a, a lot of you may have done in the past with marine traffic, you know, you can you can spot the ship as it's been a casualty. You can spot the tugs around the ship, but we can provide, or Chris can provide you with a more detailed, um, you know, uh, minute by minute uh, plot of what's happened um, in a situation for a, uh, a, a very reasonable cost. And uh, it, it can be it can be done within like three or four hours of the actual incident happening, hopefully, depending on the time of the day. But uh, we're a 24 hour service, so Chris is smiling there, so he's available 24 hours. But um, yep. That's the AIS Quick View service that uh, we're we're providing. Oh, thank you very much.